And uh, before we start the movie, I want to thank everybody who made Source to See possible. Uh, when Zach and I graduated from CC last May, we didn't have a lot of money. And even though it doesn't cost a lot to camp next to the river and eat rice and beans, we couldn't have done it without support. So the State of the Rockies project provi um, provided us with camera equipment, with logistical support, and the opportunity right now to show this movie. Let me uh, first of all say that it's uh, an honor for me to be here at the Colorado College. And uh, to see so many of you, uh, many of you who were my friends when I was here at, uh, in school back in the 1970s, and many of you who have been my, my great mentors, my professors, and uh, who really have been the wind under the wings that I have had uh, in my life's uh, own journey. Let me uh, say a quick word about uh, the Department of Interior because I think uh, oftentimes uh, it is not a department that is uh, well understood by people around the country. Uh, when President Obama asked me to be his cabinet secretary, uh, I knew it was an important position and I knew it was seventh in line to the presidency of the United States. And I also knew that there was a misnomer about the Department of Interior because it was seen so much as being the Department of the West because we have huge land holdings uh, as the United States of America and places like Nevada where more than 80% of the land in Nevada is owned by the United States of America, all of you, the taxpayers, the citizens of this country, managed by the BLM. But I wanted to make sure that people really understood what the Department of Interior was. So shortly after I was uh, sworn in as Secretary of Interior, I went to the Statue of Liberty because I wanted to make sure that everybody in America understood that uh, the Department of Interior really is a Department of America. I believe, as I've often uh, have told the President, including on a very recent flight with him, that this is the best job that there is for any member of the Cabinet, because I get to enjoy all of these wonderful things. And I do believe that in my time as uh, Secretary of Interior in uh, the last three and a half years, we have made a difference in some very important ways. I'm also proud of the work that we've done in conservation. And I know when we look at uh, the push on the Colorado River and the Delta and the future of uh, the uh, border and recovering or area, which needs obviously a lot of work below the, uh, the U.S.-Mexico line, that there's a lot of work that we need to do in the conservation arena. And my strong belief is that uh, whenever we talk about energy and economic development and people say that we have to choose between energy and economic development, and conservation, that it is a false choice that they provide to us. I think that we can do both. And I think that we are seeing how we are doing it here in Colorado. And there's all sorts of projects, whether it's on the AMPA or in the San Luis Valley, where we're still working on similar initiatives uh, that I am very proud of. But I remember during that campaign that people would come up to me and they would say, why are you concerned about conservation and about these places? I would tell them, because it's about the quality of life. When we're out recruiting companies to come here to the state of Colorado, what brings them to our great state? What brings them to our great state is the fact that we have the quality of life here, that we have the beauty of the mountains. When I think about Colorado Springs and Pikes Peak and some of the ranching areas to the west of us here, I think that it is the beauty of this state and the conservation ethic that we've been able to develop in this state that has given us great promise also for good economics in the future. And there are three legs to this tripod of this conservation agenda for the United States. One of them is about rivers. One of those legs is about rivers. So just like here on the Colorado River where there is so much complexity and so much difficulty, we believe that there are at least 200 major river projects in the United States of America where we will see very significant restoration efforts 
that are underway now and we'll continue to see them in the future. Second tripod or the second uh, leg of this tripod has to do with uh, great urban parks in this 21st century. We've come, come a long ways from the time when uh, President uh, uh, Teddy Roosevelt was the wilderness warrior and the conservation president of our country because in those days we had mostly a rural population. Today most of our population, 80%, lives in the urban areas. And so we have to find ways of connecting up our urban people, our urban young people, also to the great outdoors. We do it in the rural communities as well. But that's why in New York City, working with Mayor Bloomberg, we are creating a new crown jewel of what will be the largest, great, the largest uh, urban campground and wildlife area in the United States of America, this country. And then the third leg uh, are our national landscapes. If you think about the landscapes that are of national significance to us, there are many, uh, and we're working on them all around the country, country through landscape conservation cooperatives. And we have and are, have forged ahead with the Landscape Conservation Cooperative on the Colorado River. So many of the challenges that you see here, many of the challenges that you will see Marsha describe will be, about, uh, will be resolved through that kind of conservation cooperative. Now, as I look at that part of our America's Great Outdoors agenda and the conservation agenda and how I talk to the President about it, I describe it in ways that uh, I think uh, accomplish both economic goals, uh, at the same time accomplish a conservation agenda. So when we started putting together our priorities uh, at the very beginning of the administration, one of the things that the President and I spoke about was the importance of having an all of the above energy strategy. And so yes, we recognize that uh, we cannot simply find the silver bullet that will take down gas prices, nobody can. And during these political times and political years, there's a lot of rhetoric that essentially has uh, bumper, sticker, uh, bumper stickers that say we can drive down the price of energy if we drill everywhere in America. You remember the old mantra, drill, baby, drill. Well, all of you who are here, because you're smart, will remember and you've studied what happened in the past when we had these kinds of oil uh, oil and gas uh, price hikes like the one that we're experiencing today. You'll remember Richard Nixon and the formation of OPEC and his standing in front of the people of the United States and saying, we must be energy independent. And you remember Jimmy Carter as President of the United States when he said we had to confront the challenge before us and we needed to move forward with energy independence with the moral imperative of war, with the moral imperative of war. And that was a time when I was in this school, and I remember that we were importing 30% of our oil from foreign countries. When I went to be the United States Senator for Colorado, we were importing around 60% of our oil from foreign countries. Well, today, as a result, in large part, by the work that this president and uh, private industry have done, we are now importing only 45% of our oil from foreign countries. That's down from where it was 60% a few years ago. Now it's important for us for some very fundamental principles uh, for our country, important for our national security because we don't want to have our foreign policy tied essentially to what's happening to the oil czars in different places around the world. It's important for our economic security because it fuels our economy and it fuels jobs. And it's important also for our environment because if we can find ways of powering our economy in cleaner ways, we'll be able to tackle some of the challenges that we face, including climate change. And this is just a basic fact. Last year alone, we imported one million barrels of oil less a day. One million barrels of oil less a day into this country because of the implementation of that all of the above strategy, which includes energy efficiency. So I'm proud of the work that we have done. Now the last point uh, before I turn it over to Marsh on the Colorado River is this. Yeah, the Colorado River was uh, and has been uh, a highly litigated river over a very long period of time. And when those compacts were put together, they were put together not with the best of knowledge and not with the best of science. There were states that were negotiating among themselves and finally those, that compact came together among the states ratified by the United States uh, Congress signed off by the president. But what they did is they missed the mark by some two million acre feet, okay? Because those who were forecasting how much water would be available from the Colorado River 
simply made a, a mistake. They thought there was a lot more water there than there actually was. And so much of what you have seen in terms of the conflict and the acrimony, much of which I have been involved in over the last 20 years, has been about the fact that the Colorado River is already a water short, year, water short river. That more water from that river has been allocated than what that river has today. And not only among the seven states, but also with Mexico, because we have a treaty with Mexico that requires us to deliver a certain amount of water to Mexico. So we're working on all of those issues. We're working on all those issues. We're working on it through water conservation, and we're working on it with a, a new agreement with Mexico that we hope to be able to announce soon. We're working on what we do with respect to the recovery efforts for the endangered species on the Colorado River. We're working on it in terms of protecting the water quality of the Grand Canyon, where I set aside under my authority a million acres from, uh, protected from uranium mining because we don't want the water quality on the Colorado River to be affected. So we're working on it from a whole host of fronts. But the one point that I want to leave you with here tonight is its nexus to something that is also a very politically hot issue. Your congressman here from Colorado Springs is proposing that we move full bore ahead with oil shale development in the West, that it is the Saudi Arabia and the panacea to all of America's energy needs. Well, he's not talking about shale gas in uh, the Bakken Formation in uh, North Dakota. What he's talking about is a shale, oil shale, in the western part of Colorado, where this state has most of the oil shale. And what it is, is taking essentially what they call kerogen from a rock and making oil out of it. Well, some of us have been around this uh, rodeo before and know what happened when that was tried multiple times, including in the 1980s, when we had the largest bust in uh, economic history of the Western Slope, because all of a sudden the companies found out that they couldn't develop it, because it takes a tremendous amount of energy to develop carriage and, and ultimately oil from oil shale. It takes a huge amount of energy. But the nexus here for the Colorado River and Walt, you and your 40 students who are smarter than the world need to make sure that we are letting the world know about this, is how much water, how much water would be required to develop those oil shale resources? Some estimates I've seen are over a million acre feet. Some estimates I've seen two million acre feet. Well, where would that water come from? Is there any water left in the Colorado River? Is there any water there to be allocated? What's going to be the consequence to the municipalities that you represent, Hank Worley, if all of a sudden we have a million more acre feet that are being consumed in oil shale development? What's going to be the consequence to ranchers and farmers who are so dependent on the water supply of the Colorado River? What's going to be the consequence to the 25 million Americans, 25 million Americans, who depend on the Colorado River for their water supply. So there is indeed a nexus between energy and the water supply of the Colorado River, energy in a larger sense, and water supply and water quality issues. And so we work to try to balance all of those issues. Let me finally just say that um, I am very optimistic that no matter how hard any of these problems are, eight mines that we have in this country and the great minds that we have here in Colorado College, the 40 students who participated in this year's project, that we can solve any one of these problems. Thank you very much.